This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the Razor Blade Stealth 13 for late 2019. And this one is interesting because, you know, when they first announced the Stealth years ago, and they said, look, it's a 13-inch gaming Ultrabook. And let's be frank, it was not. It was your usual 15-watt Ultrabook CPUs with integrated graphics. And no, that's not a gaming laptop. And then they moved it up, and you got NVIDIA MX150 graphics, which is a really low-end GPU, still not really gaming, but a little more oomph than most Ultrabooks, not all. And now we have something really interesting, Intel 10th generation CPU inside, and we have the option with the NVIDIA GTX 1650 Max-Q graphics inside, so that's the same graphics you'd find in something like the Dell XPS 15 and the Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Extreme 2nd Gen for 2019. In other words, 15-inch slim and light mobile workstation kind of laptops, and even entry-level gaming laptops, too. So they put this in a 13-inch laptop. How does it do? We're going to find out now. Now, there are a couple of different configurations of the Stealth for the end of 2019. So the one that we have is the Max model with that GTX 1650 Max-Q graphics inside, and that one is $1,800 with a full HD display, 60 hertz. There are no fast refresh display options here. And if you want to get it with a 4K touchscreen, add on $200. So yes, it is an expensive laptop. It's a pretty unique laptop, though, so we'll give it a pass for the moment on that. There's also a model that has... Intel Iris Plus graphics, no dedicated graphics whatsoever. And Iris Plus is pretty exciting. It comes with the Intel 10th Gen CPUs, and it really ups the ante. It gets close to, but still not quite there with the MX150, a lot of ump. So that one that has only Intel Iris graphics has the same Intel 10th Gen i7 CPU, but it's given 25 watts to work with instead of 15 watts in our unit because there's less thermal constraint there. We'll get into that a little bit more. So that one's an interesting one, too, at $1,500. Certainly not a gaming laptop, but nice and powerful. And there's a lot to be said for the Stealth in terms of its build quality, its looks. It's just a very nice premium laptop. And then there's still the Intel 8th Gen with NVIDIA MX150 graphics available, which, again, does push above the Intel Iris Plus graphics. So it's still an appealing option, and it's only $1,300 now. So it's still worth considering if you're not looking for something that actually is a gaming or video editing laptop in an impossibly small, light, 13-inch form factor. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, what was I talking about with those CPUs? So the Intel 10th generation Ice Lake CPU, the Core i7, same model, is available in two different power envelopes. So uh, as always with CPUs, you can give them more wattage, but they're usually limited because heat becomes an issue or all that sort of thing. So the Iris Plus graphics model doesn't have to share any power envelope or any thermal headroom with a dedicated GPU, so it can go for 25 watts. So in theory, you'll get a little bit more CPU performance. If you're typically doing CPU-dependent tasks more so than gaming, then it's certainly worth a look, and you'll get that little Intel Iris oomph. So our model has the 15-watt quad-core CPU inside, so it's not so different from Whiskey Lake, but it's a 10 nanometer process. And instead of 14 nanometer, which is what we had in Whiskey Lake and the past several generations of Ultrabook CPU. So what that really gets you is a bit better battery life and better thermals. So there's the advantage there. In terms of performance, it's a bit faster, but it's not night and day faster. It's still, yeah, there's that. So when you have the GTX 1650 in here, obviously you've got a lot of thermal constraints going on and to a certain extent, some power constraints too. This comes with a 100 watt adapter. It's like the baby version of the usual black razor brick. And that's the max you can deliver over USB-C, which this one plugs into. So what you're going to notice right away, and it's something that Razer clued us into, and there's still some driver issues and stuff going on with this. It's not the most stable laptop at launch, but there are some benchmarks like Cinebench R15 that sometimes actually show low CPU performance because it's triggering the dedicated GPU when it shouldn't particularly R20, which doesn't even look at the GPU at all. That happens for Cinebench R20. So it gets to be a little hazy, hazy. If you're calling on the GPU with what you're doing for work, then the CPU will be less performant. Basically, they downpower it they, to avoid thermal issues. There. In fact, the CPU runs quite cool. A lot of the time when we're using it, we're seeing it 75, 80 degrees centigrade, even when it's working hard doing something like playing well, Tomb Raider. Of course, you do have different power settings you can choose from. You can go for performance mode, balanced mode, uh, their low power consumption mode. Razer has a couple of different profiles, and the high performance setting does make a difference there. 
So while CPU temperatures are nice and relatively low, the fans on this are really not loud. It's pretty impressively quiet, even if it is working hard. Say when I was playing Shadow of the Tomb Raider and the CPU and GPU utilization were pretty high on this, it's relatively speaking a quiet laptop. In everyday productivity, you're just not really going to hear the fans. Speaking of playing something like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, that's what's so miraculous here. This is the first 13-inch Ultrabook we've seen that can do this all by itself without using an eGPU like the Razer Core. It actually works. I played Shadow of the Tomb Raider on medium settings at 1080p, and you can see the frame rates. We've got some sample footage going there from when I was gaming. It's typically around 45 frames per second. If you drop it down to low, then you can get 60 frames per second. So Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a very demanding recent title. If you're playing something that's a bit older but still kind of, you know, like Borderlands 2 or something like that, a little bit older, but still pretty demanding. You can actually set the quality up to medium, sometimes even high, and play at 1080p, which is, wow, amazing. Also, for video editing, it makes all the difference in the world. So for those of you who are budding YouTubers or you just like to edit your drone footage or whatever, the GPU really kicks in with those CUDA cores in something like Adobe Premiere, and it can cut your times in half for exports, which is really sweet. If you're playing something that's really CPU intensive, like say Civ 6, well, then it's going to perform like any other Ultrabook out there pretty much. It doesn't really help you that you have this awesome GPU. So when you're buying this Dell, think about what it is you want to do. If you do actually want to have gaming going on in your 13-inch laptop, obviously the GTX 1650 Max-Q is it. If you just want to do old titles, casual gaming, the MX150, older generation will do you just fine. And the Iris Plus is almost as good as that. And it's more for people who are looking for an Ultrabook that's well equipped with a beautiful build quality and all that. In terms of the build quality, it's pretty much the same chassis that we've seen. A little minor changes on it, but it's your usual CNC aluminum unibody design. It's beautiful looking. If you go with the GTX version, you're going to get it in matte black. And if you go for the Intel Iris model, you're going to get that nice mercury white look. It has a chroma backlight keyboard, but it's not RGB per key. It's single zone backlighting. So you can pick from any color in the world, but you can only have one color at a time, and that is to save power. To Microsoft Precision Trackpad, as always, Razer does a good job with that. Um, back to the keyboard again. You know, I've never really loved Razer keyboards, even though I've owned a Blade 15, but either I'm getting used to them or getting a little bit better. It's still very low travel, but the tactile feel to me seems a little bit better than it did before. In terms of the rest of the specs, RAM is soldered on board. We have low power DDR4 now and 16 gigs of RAM. So that's fast RAM, 37, 33 megahertz. And an M.2 NVMe SSD, there's a single slot inside. And the capacity is going to vary depending on which model you order. Our GTX model comes with a 512 gig SSD. Ports on this, well, they're symmetrical, though not necessarily symmetrical in function. We have two USB-C ports, only the one on the right supports Thunderbolt 3. It's full 40 gigabit per second, works with the Razer Core. The one on the left is USB-C Gen 2. And so you'll probably be using that one on the left for the charger as well. We have two USB-A ports, which is nice to see because as 13-inch Ultrabooks get smaller and lighter, we often see things like USB-A ports go out the window and then you have to use dongles. So at least not here. And of course you have a headphone jack. No micro SD card slot, no, no HDMI, that's it. So you will need adapters for things like that. Sound on this is pretty good. It's still a 13-inch Ultrabook, so we're not talking a whole lot of bass here, but the stereo separation is really impressive. We have stereo speakers, but you've got two drivers on the left and on the right surrounding the keyboard and firing upwards, sort of like a MacBook Pro design. So it's really actually quite pleasant to listen to if you are doing something like gaming, where the separation can help you figure out who's coming from where, if you don't happen to be wearing headphones. Typically, Razer offers very nice displays. This time we have that 4K touchscreen option, again, which is $200 additional. Otherwise, you can get a matte full HD display. And it's a very nice display. It's your typical full sRGB coverage, fairly well calibrated from the factory. I have no complaints, and I do enjoy a touchscreen on a smaller laptop. You might say 4K is overkill, but if you're doing photo editing, it can be handy. It requires less zooming in to see detail, that sort of thing. So it's nice to have. When it comes to heat and noise, like I said, you would think the GTX 1650 would be a total disaster in here, but well, thanks to the vapor chamber cooling, the two heat pipes, which are pretty decent on this, adequate ventilation, and also the fact that there's some obvious throttling for power and for thermals on this. And so the CPU never really gets that hot. I mean, really, they seem to have more thermal headroom, in my opinion, and even the GTX 1650 really has more headroom than where they're running it at. Will they update it with more 
future BIOSes to let it get a little toastier? Maybe. That said, is really, relatively speaking, not hot to the touch. I mean, the HP Spectre X360 late 2019 model with the OLED display that we'll be reviewing soon gets a lot hotter to the touch. So does the Dell XPS 13 with Intel 10th generation CPUs. So that's the nice part. For those of you who are buying this and you're primarily looking at it for productivity, this is not something that is going to get hot. And part of that is their great cooling and also Intel 10th generation 10 nanometer CPUs just don't get as hot. They also have better battery life. So despite the performance that we're seeing in here, if you're using it for productivity kind of work or streaming video, that sort of thing, and the, the GTX is not getting called in very much for work, well, battery life is actually not so much different than the MX150 outgoing model that's still available, which is really impressive. So anywhere from seven to nine hours of light and productivity work, if you're pushing it hard, if you're doing Premiere Pro, for example, unplugged, well, you're gonna get shorter battery life, no kidding, or if you're trying to do Blender renders. But really for those kinds of activities, typically one likes to plug the laptop in to get full performance anyway. It's a 53 watt hour battery, and like I said, it's a 100 watt USB-C based charger that comes with this. If you go with the Intel Iris model, it'll be a 65 watt charger. Taking off the bottom cover is pretty easy, as long as you have a Torx T5 screwdriver, you remove the visible screws. While we're looking here, notice we got the little ventilation grills for the fans along here as well, and there's also in the back edge behind the display overhang. And as always, they do a nice job with the rubber strips over here, so this raises it up a little bit more in the back, so you get a little better airflow. So comes right off pretty easily once you unscrew the screws, and here is our battery, should you need to service it in the future. The vapor chamber style cooling system that we've seen on the Blade 15, and it's good to see that they have four screws for each one of these. No tripod heat sink, so even pressure is the idea there. Two fans for your CPU and your GPU. There's our M.2 SSD. Personally, I've seen them not use a Samsung SSD. This is a light on, as it's labeled there. Uh, but the speeds on are quite good. And there's our socketed Intel Wi-Fi card. That's Wi-Fi 6 AX201. RAM is soldered on. 16 gigs is what you get with this, and that's all it will ever be. So that's the Razer Blade Stealth 13 for late 2019 with the GTX graphics inside. So it is a wonder. It is the first 13-inch gaming Ultrabook. Obviously, you're going to be a little CPU-bound with some games, particularly if they are more CPU-dependent. But for something like video editing or doing some Blender work on the go where you really don't want to have a 15 or 17-inch laptop, this one is a pretty good stand-in. I like to see them let it push itself a little harder in terms of giving it a little bit more thermal room to play and stuff like that, but still... Pretty impressive. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and hit that notification bell.